Well, tonight, we're going to be looking at two passages that I'm sure you're probably all familiar with, one in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and one in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we as grace believers should clearly understand what these verses teach us about the rapture. But you know, there are a lot of folks out there that have differing views of the rapture. And we're going to be looking at some of those tonight. But before we get into the specifics, there are several general overriding principles that I think we need to be grounded in before we get into the specifics. First of all, there are two ways to look at these events. One is that they're literal. The other is that they're symbolic. Now, we as students of the Bible believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible unless something in the context tells us that it's symbolic. With that in mind, there's another general thing to bear in mind as we study this topic and as we look at these views of the rapture. Many events in the Bible have been prophesied. But the rapture has not. It was not foretold before it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. And I really appreciated Pastor Ken Lawson's article in the December 2023 Berean Searchlight. And if you haven't read that article or if you've read it, I would encourage you to go back and reread it. And this is what he says. And I quote, we do not read of the rapture of the church outside of Paul's epistles. Paul taught by revelation that the church, the body of Christ, is a mystery or secret unknown to the men of previous ages. The rapture is the blessed hope of this church and the final act of God for our dispensation. Therefore, it cannot be part of Israel's program of prophecy outlined by the Old Testament prophets. Since those prophets foretold of the tribulation, the body of Christ cannot be there without violating its distinctive character as a new creation, separate and distinct from Israel. End quote. I think that puts it very well. Then there are two more things to consider before we look at the differing views of the rapture. There are those who do not see the rapture and the second coming as separate events. And they use Matthew 24 primarily as their source of this idea. And we'll deal with that a little bit later. But the other thing people have been trying to do is to set a specific date for either the rapture or the second coming of Christ. In fact, I, in our board meeting the other day, I, w I heard that there was a grace pastor that actually set a date for the rapture. Well, guess what? It hadn't come yet. At least not that I know of. I hope not. <laughs> There's another article that I would encourage you to read. If you don't have a copy of the Daily Transformation book by uh, John Fredrickson, I would encourage you to read that because there's an article in there on the end times, and it's really good if you read that. But people have been trying to set a date for these events, and this is nothing new. One such group was led by evangelist William Miller. All over the Northeast, a half a million people who followed Miller awaited the end of the world on April 3rd, 1843. Journalists had a field day, and I had a chuckle when I read a couple of these things. Some of his followers were reported to be on mountaintops hoping for a head start to heaven. 
Others were in graveyards planning to go up in union with their departed loved ones. And some high society ladies gathered outside of town to avoid being caught up with the common people. <laughs> When April 4th dawned as usual, they were disappointed. But they took heart because their leader had set a range of dates, all of which came and went. When Miller died, this was engraved on his tombstone. At the time appointed, then the end will come. Both the end of the dispensation of grace and the second coming of Christ will be accomplished in God's perfect timing. <clears throat> this brings to mind another consideration while we're looking at these beliefs in the rapture. Much of the confusion comes w when the other folks do not recognize the separate and distinct revelation given to the Apostle Paul. And so we're going to look briefly at what these folks believe. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I just want to give you an idea of some of the things that they believe. And then we're going to look at the scripture to see if these things actually will hold up as we rightly divide the word of truth. So let's look at what some folks believe about the rapture. First, there are those who do not believe in the rapture at all. There are several religious denominations that I am aware of that I will not mention that do not believe in the rapture of the body of Christ. And so what do the scriptures have to say about that? Well, here's where we're going to look at our two references. The first one is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But before we go there, look with me at Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. You see, it was in God's perfect timing that he revealed this secret coming to the Apostle Paul, one that was not known in previous ages. The revelation of the mystery was hidden in the mind of God until his perfect timing. And as we turn to 1 Thessalonians, there is hope for those who have died in Christ during this age of grace and hope for us who are still here on earth. In fact, Titus chapter 2 verse 13 refers to this as the believer's blessed hope. And a quick definition of biblical hope, I think, is in order here. And throughout the scriptures, biblical hope can be defined as a confident and joyous expectation of future good. Now, without going into a lot of detail in these, the two passages listed on the top of the slide there, when taken literally, they clearly teach the rapture of the church. Even though the, rap the word rapture is not used. We'll get to that in just a second here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Everyone who has believed the gospel for today will be caught up or be a part of the rapture to meet the Lord in the air. For the words caught up, the Latin Bible uses the verb form that we get our word rapture from. Look at verse 15, where Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This wasn't something that Paul made up or someone else made up. He received it directly from the Lord. Lord. 
And I mentioned before that this is a verb. What does a verb do? It, it indicates some kind of action. And so this is an apt description of what is going to happen to us as members of the body of Christ. This rapture could occur at any time. I would encourage those of you that are here tonight, that my prayer is that you have all trusted in Christ for your salvation and that you will be a part of the rapture. But if you are here tonight or if you are watching this live streaming or if you will look at it in the future on YouTube or buy a CD or DVD, I would encourage you to trust Christ by believing the gospel, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Once a person believes that Christ died for them and died for their sins personally, they too will be able to be a part of the rapture of the church which this passage clearly teaches. Author George Sweeting says this about the rapture. The truth of the catching away of the church was important to my father. I remember him calling it to our attention as children. On one occasion, after reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he quietly and methodically faced each of his six children with the question, if Jesus were to return tonight, would you be ready? It was moving to hear each child answer, yes, I am ready. Father, then let us in singing the hymn, will the circle be unbroken when he comes? And he goes on to say that that is a question each individual must answer. If I had the time tonight, I would like to come to each one of you and ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? My prayer is that if you're not, that you would trust in Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross for you. I find it interesting that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starts with the gospel and ends with a passage about the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, we learn that not everyone will die before the rapture, but that every believer will be changed. Both the dead in Christ and those who are alive at the rapture must put on immortality before we can meet the Lord. In an Amazing Grace Favorites article by Pastor Robert Hanna, he says this, to distinguish between Israel's hope and the hope for the body of Christ. He says, quote, Christ will return physically to the earth and will set up his prophesied earthly kingdom as promised to Israel. But the church which is his body, he does not touch down upon the earth. Rather, the members of his body are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But there's also a practical application for believers today who are looking for that blessed hope found in the rapture. Pastor Floyd Baker Sr. in an Amazing Grace Favorites article puts it this way. And again I quote, The word looking can be rendered expecting as well. It was the looking or the expecting of the Lord that gave them, grace believers, direction in their lives. When his people are looking for him to come, they will be busy serving him in their lives, end quote. That's the application for us today. As we are expecting him to catch us away, he doesn't want us to just be sitting around or going up on a mountaintop or hanging out in a graveyard or going outside hoping we don't get caught up with the other common people. 
He wants us to be serving him in whatever way he has called us to do that. Pastor Baker goes on to say, again, why should we lose sight of this precious truth? There are many today who have given up looking for Christ and are looking for the Antichrist. How sad and tragic this is. If men do not see the distinctiveness of Paul's message and the dispensation of grace, they might be well led astray. End quote. And that's true. Because as we go on, we're going to see that a lot of what the erroneous beliefs are in terms of the rapture of the church have led people astray. We're going to look at two very closely related views, the mid-tribulation people and the pre-wrath people. Mid-tribulationists believe that the body of Christ will go through the first three and one-half years of the tribulation and will be taken out of the world prior to the bold judgments. Therefore, the rapture and Christ's second coming are separated by three and a half years. They use 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 to support their view of these events by saying that the following things will happen before the rapture. Number one, apostasy. Number two, the revelation of the Antichrist. And number three, the day of Christ or the day of the Lord. And we'll look at these verses in just a moment. They also say that the Antichrist will not be revealed until the midpoint of the tribulation. They also say that the trumpet of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, is the same trumpet mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And they place the rapture in Revelation chapter 11 prior to the second half of the tribulation. So, as we rightly divide the word of truth, will this hold up to the test of scripture? Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verses 1 through 4. And I'll read those verses. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of, perdi son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Those are the verses that they use. So as we read these verses, there are several things that Paul wants them and us to know. In their day, some were teaching that the rapture had already taken place and that the Thessalonian believers had missed it. His appeal to them was not to be shaken or troubled or deceived, and it is based on the truth of the rapture. As Pastor Stam points out in his commentary on Thessalonians, he didn't want them to be robbed of their blessed hope by spirit, that is, by the supposed gift of prophecy, in other words, seeing that the rapture had already occurred, by word, an argument of men that it had already occurred, or by letter, 
supposedly from Paul. It appears as though someone had forged some letters in Paul's name saying that Paul believed that the rapture had already occurred. But let's move on to a more important issue as we look at verse 3, where there are three important things to see. And I think that also includes part of verse 2, because it talks about that day. That's the second coming of Christ, and not the rapture. Because there are two things that will need to happen before the day of the Lord. One of these two prior events is found in the next phrase in the verse, which refers to the falling away. Now here we must be diligent students of the Bible. Our English word apostasy, which means a rebellion or revolt, does not have the same meaning as the Greek word apostasia, which has been transferred falling away. The Greek word simply means departure and nothing more. While it is true that people have rebelled or revolted from the teachings of Paul, this has been going on since he started preaching the mystery. You'll recall his statement in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, where he tells Timothy, all in Asia have forsaken me. All in Asia have turned away from me. So this has been going on since the beginning of the dispensation of grace. What this verse in 2 Thessalonians is talking about is another departure of some kind. This verse simply teaches that the body of Christ will depart before the tribulation period starts. And then as we go on and read verses 3 and 4, we see that the next thing that will happen is that the man of sin, the son of perdition, or the Antichrist will be revealed at this time. And that he will be active from the beginning of the tribulation, not at the midpoint of the tribulation as these folks believe. We have seen how the Thessalonians were comforted by Paul in his first epistle concerning those who had died in Christ. But in this passage, he's primarily dealing with those who are living, which will include us today. Bible teacher John Baker gives us further insight into these verses in another amazing Grace Favorites article where he says, quote, Paul's second epistle to the Thessalonians was written upon his hearing of their anxiety touching the living saints. He writes to assure them that in spite of what they might have heard from others, the dreadful day of the Lord could not have come until the saints the members of, of the body of Christ are gone. Only after the church is gathered unto Christ and taken out of this sin-cursed world will the man of sin, the wicked one, be revealed. Then those who rejected the truth along with the wicked one become the due objects of God's wrath. End quote. What better motivation for us to reach the lost out there so that they will not experience the wrath of God during the tribulation? And we'll touch on that again a little bit later on, Lord willing. Another thing that they believe is that the trumpet of 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians is the same trumpet found in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. So, Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. And we'll also look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. First Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, 
For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And then later, in just a little bit, we'll flip over to Revelation 11:15, and I'm going to turn there so that I don't have to do that. I'll give you a heads up to get there too. First passage in 1 Corinthians, we see that the last trump will be blown. This is a military term used to close out this dispensation and call the soldiers that are part of the body of Christ home. The passage in 1 Thessalonians refers to this as the trump of God, which will be the signal for us to depart and meet the Lord in the air. This trumpet blast has nothing to do with Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, which says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. <coughs> Pastor Paul Sadler in Revelation volume 2 gives us further clarification on the difference between the two trumpets. The last trump spoken of by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 is using the word last in a point of time. In other words, it finalizes something, the end of the age of grace. When John writes about the trumpets in Revelation and the seventh trumpet in particular, he is referring to it as the last in a sequence of of seven. This will not mark the end of Jacob's trouble, which refers to the second half of the Great Tribulation, because the seven bowl judgments will follow the seven trumpet blasts. All of the trumpets in Revelation will be sounded, but none of them will be sounded before the last trump of the Age of Grace is blown. One other thing to note before we move on, is that God is progressively revealing his word to us. And so in order for their assertion to be true that that, rev that, that trumpet in Revelation is the same one as in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that meant that 1 Corinthians would have had to have been written after Revelation, but it wasn't. It was written before Revelation. So it's talking about two entirely different events. Now related to this is those who hold the pre-wrath position. Their basic belief is that there's a difference between the wrath of the Antichrist and the wrath of God. They contend that the body of Christ along with other believers will have to endure the Antichrist's wrath and the persecution of the church and then they will be taken out. They don't specify when it will happen, but it will happen sometime, they say, while the Antichrist is persecuting the church. We will be taken out of the world before this persecution starts, as we see in the following verses. And again, we turn to the Bible to make sure that this is true. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I'm sure that you are all familiar with these verses. First Thessalonians 9 and 10. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned from 
to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Verse 9 talks about their salvation and ours as we believe the gospel for today and turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 10 says that we are waiting for Christ to come from heaven. But notice that the end of the verse where it says that Jesus will deliver us from the wrath to come. The great tribulation is consistently and prophetically linked to the wrath of God, which will be poured out on an unbelieving world. This verse makes no distinction between the wrath of the Antichrist and the wrath of God. It simply tells us very plainly that we have been saved from the wrath to come. Aren't you glad about that tonight? Amen. Amen. It clearly says that we will be saved from all of the wrath. Let's look at their claim that comes from Matthew chapter 24, verse 22. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22. Matthew 24, 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, these days will be shortened. In his excellent book, God's Meaning in Matthew, Pastor John Fredrickson describes five theories related to this phrase. And you can read about them on pages 399 and 400. But he tells us that the best explanation means that the wrath of God or the great tribulation will be confined to the second half of the tribulation in the last three and a half years. Once again, this has nothing to do with the rapture or the body of Christ since we will already be in our heavenly home. There's one more thing for us to think about regarding this pre-wrath view. Pastor Paul Sadler makes it clear in the introduction to the first volume on the book of Revelation, where he says, quote, since we have escaped the wrath to come, it was not needful for Paul to instruct the members of the body of Christ to heed the warnings found in the Olivet Discourse or the book of Revelation, end quote. Paul never gives us instructions in his epistles to prepare for the wrath to come. Why? Because we won't be there. As we move on, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because my time is fleeting away, there are some who believe in the post-tribulation rapture. They compare Matthew 24, 29 to 31 with 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17. And they suggest that Paul's statement that the dead in Christ rise first will be fulfilled at the end of the tribulation. Um, again, <laughs> I don't understand when you rightly divide the word of truth how you can come to that conclusion because you're talking about two different groups here. The group in Matthew 24 and the group in 1 Thessalonians 4 are different groups. And I want to point out something else. If you go to Matthew 24, 38 to 41, and we won't take time to read those, but if you read them, remember these verses, it's talking about some being left and some being taken. And it's comparing it with the time just before the great flood. 
You all remember back in Genesis chapter 6, and I want to ask you a question. If you had been around in Genesis before the flood, would you want to be left or taken? <clears throat> this is not a trick question. Who were the only ones that were saved during the great flood? Those that were left in the ark. Those that were taken were taken to judgment. <clears throat> That's why he compares that with the days of Noah. Now, let's contrast that with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. In those verses, do you want to be left or do you want to be taken? Not a trick question, is it? You want to be taken because we will be taken to meet the Lord in the air. Those left will go through the great tribulation and experience the wrath of God. There's lots more that we could look at here. But I want to go to one more group. And I actually met a pastor that pastored a church when we were down in Edinburgh, Illinois, that actually believed this. There are those that are called amillennialists. They believe that there's no rapture and that the thousand-year kingdom began with the resurrection of Christ citing Colossians 1.18 and Revelation 20 verses 4 to 6 saying that these are the same resurrection their view is that the thousand year reign of Christ is not literal but symbolic and that it began simultaneously with the church age which they say started at Pentecost they cite Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. And I'm sure that you're familiar with this passage. It talks about Peter quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel. And if you look at that passage, there are some events that happen, but there are some events that will be yet to happen. Uh, the moon turning to blood is a good example of that. And one of the things to realize is that their interpretation of this is not literal, it's symbolic. And they compare Colossians 1.18 with uh, the, past, the other passage. So let's look at Colossians 1.18. It describes Christ as the head of the body of Christ, which is a separate and distinct church for this age of grace. It's not the same as the church at Pentecost, which was the kingdom church. Next, he's described as the firstborn from the dead. He was the first one to have been raised by his own power. And his resurrection is a guarantee of other resurrections and we can rest in that. Again in Acts chapter 2 verses 16 through 21 those events in, ch in verses 20 and 21 have not happened yet. And I want to give you an example of that did any of you on April 8th of this year go to some place where you could see the, the total eclipse of the sun? Wow, cool. Was it good? Okay. Why were you able to go in a place where you could see that? Because scientists were able to predict the exact path so that those that wanted to go and watch it could watch it. The events that the Bible describes in Acts chapter 2 verses 20 and 21 will be supernatural in nature. <clears throat> 
Scientists will not be able to predict them. And I remember reading a book that somebody gave me uh, by a pastor who I will not name, uh, called The Four Blood Moons or something like that. And as I read that book, it's like he is saying that this prophecy is being fulfilled. Well, we've all experienced blood red moons, but that's not what's going to happen in Acts, that they are going to be supernatural in nature. One other verse that I want to mention is in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, because this group believes that the kingdom of God is spiritual. It's not physical in nature. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting you to go to the wrong one. Go to Luke 17, 20 and 21. Because here, they're saying that the kingdom cannot be observed. And in this passage, the Pharisees are saying to Christ, you know, where is the kingdom of God? Is the kingdom of God in us? And I like what Pastor Charles Baker in his book, Understanding the Gospel, says about these verses. The Pharisees demanded to know when the kingdom of God would come. Jesus' answer has been twisted to mean that the kingdom of God will never come in a literal sense upon the earth, but that it is entirely a spiritual condition within the hearts of men. And I like this, I like what he says about this. Even a superficial reading of the text should be evidence enough that Jesus was not telling the Pharisees who were plotting to kill him that the kingdom of God was in their hearts. That's right. That would have been the last place to look for the kingdom of God. What Jesus said was the kingdom of God is in your midst. And why was the kingdom of God in their midst? Because Christ was there. And this relates back to what we talked about before, that the kingdom of God was at hand. It was ready to be set up by God if the conditions were right. But that prophetic clock stopped when this age of grace began. But make no mistake about it, when this age of grace is brought to its conclusion, God will go back immediately and pick up where he left off. The rapture and the second coming are two separate and distinct events when you consider the Bible rightly divided and when it is taken literally. And I'll close with a quote from Pastor John Fredrickson's April 17th Daily Transformation devotional entitled, Why Will This Happen? And here's what he says, and I quote, We who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for eternal life need not fear these days of tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 promises that we have been delivered from the wrath to come. Praise his name for this merciful blessing. Our responsibility is to rejoice in this truth. Share the gospel that others may likewise be saved and rest that even when trials come our way, God's grace will see us through. There's still time for us to reach out to the lost around us, to tell them of God's love, God's grace, and God's willingness to save them by simply believing in the finished work of Christ on the cross. May God give us opportunities to do that. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to open your word together tonight. Lord, it's hard to believe what people believe about the rapture. But we pray that you would give us the opportunity to share with folks 
the truth of the rapture, the truth of God's saving grace, so that they can come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.